So the next step is to add some alcohol, which we'll do. Get a quick little rinse, followed by a rinse with water. And the first thing you'll notice is that some of the cells have lost their coloration. All right, let's see what happens when we add the decolorizer, which is either alcohol or acetone or a mixture of the two. Here we can see the decolorizer molecules. And as they move down through that peptidoglycan layer, you see something interesting happening. You see that it's shrinking, and this is caused by dehydration. And it has a very important property for this staining because now those crystal violet iodine molecules are too large to move back through the remaining holes through that peptidoglycan, so they're stuck beneath. Now let's see what happens when we add the decolorizer to a gram-negative bacteria. So here you can see the decolorizer molecules, and they move through that outer membrane, and you'll notice it disappears, it moves through the peptidoglycan layer. Again, we see that it shrinks, again, due to dehydration. But there's an important difference, because this time the pores that remain are large enough that those crystal violet iodine molecules can move right through. So the outer membrane has been dissolved, and the remaining pores in that shrunken peptidoglycan layer allow those crystal violet iodine molecules to escape. So now we are left with a slide that is still colorless. So the final step is to add the counterstain saffron, which you can see is a pink or a reddish color. We'll do that. And as in our other staining steps, we're going to need to wait a minute. So again, we'll go have a look at what's going on inside the cell. Now let's see what happens when we add the counterstain saffron to a gram-positive cell. You'll remember that those crystal violet iodine particles were already trapped beneath. Here the saffron, you can see it's a small molecule, which has sort of a reddish or pinkish color. Uh, when we add it, it goes through that dehydrated peptidoglycan layer. It's still small enough that it can get through there. And then it's binding to those uh, phospholipid bilayer. But the thing is, it's a uh, a light pink color and it just doesn't stand out against that dark purple of that crystal violet iodine complex. So it'd be kind of like uh, you're having lunch and you get some ketchup on your shirt but you're wearing a black shirt so it doesn't really show up that well. When we add the counterstain saffron to the gram-negative cell we'll see a very different pattern. So the <coughs> saffron is a small molecule it moves easily through that dehydrated peptidoglycan layer and it binds to that phospholipid bilayer, but this time there isn't any uh, crystal violet iodine complex that has that dark purple color, so this time this cell is going to stain this reddish or pinkish color, which is going to be clearly visible. So in our analogy of getting ketchup on your shirt at lunch, this time you'd be wearing a white shirt, so that ketchup is going to show up very well. So we can see that after the final step, some of the bacteria are stained pink, while the other bacteria are stained purple. Let's review the gram staining technique. So first, bacteria is fixed on a slide, and then it's treated with crystal violet. And at this point, you can see that both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria are the shade of uh, blue or purple. They are then treated with iodine, and remember that the iodine binds with the crystal violet and makes a slightly larger molecule that is purplish in color. And again, the gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria are the same color at this stage. And the next step, the decolorization step, alcohol or acetone is added. And that causes the dehydration of the peptidoglycan layer. And when it's dehydrated, uh, it causes it to shrink. And in gram-positive bacteria, that dye is trapped below the phospholipid bilayer, while in gram-negative bacteria, the upper outer membrane has been washed away. The peptidoglycan has become dehydrated and shrunk, but the pores are still large enough that that iodine crystal violet complex is able to go right through the pores and is therefore decolorized. In the final step, a counterstain saffron is added. In the case of gram-positive bacteria, it doesn't really make a difference in the color because the stain is lighter than the purple color to begin with. On the other hand, the gram-negative bacteria didn't have any stain after the decolorization step, and now it is colored as pink or red. Let's take a moment to think about the significance of this gram-staining technique. First of all, it's fast 
inexpensive and a cheap way to define the type of a cell wall. And that's important because identifying the type of bacteria is something that goes on every day in both experimental and medical labs. And second, it may suggest effective treatments for infection. Sometimes uh, the drugs used to treat bacterial infections actually target these differences in the cell wall. Another example of how gram staining might suggest an effective treatment has to do with how pathogenic the different types of bacteria are. Gram-negative bacteria are much more virulent and therefore they might require treatment by a specialist. On the other hand, gram-positive bacteria are usually not as pathogenic and therefore a broad-spectrum antibiotic such as penicillin might be used. When using any technique in science, it's always important to realize what the limitations of that technique are. Some of the limitations of the gram stain technique are that the staining and de-staining steps are sensitive, and that just simply means you need to be careful when you do these. You can't stain for too long, otherwise you'll wind up with a really dark slide. On the other side of the coin, you can't de-stain for too long because you'll wind up without being able to see any differences between the cells. Another limitation is that it this technique must be used on cells that are less than 48 hours old, and that's because the cell wall starts to degrade as the cells get older, and this can cause the gram-positive bacteria walls to leak that crystal violet iodine, and it can be confused with the gram-negative bacteria. And a final limitation is that the results do not necessarily reflect a phylogenetic relationship. A phylogenetic relationship simply means how closely related two species are. You can see in this tree showing the relationships that species 1 and 2, which are gram-negative bacteria, are closely related, while species 3 and 4, which are gram-positive, are closely related. In this case, it would be reasonable to assume that the gram-negative bacteria are closely related and might be susceptible to the same sort of drug treatments and on the other side of the coin that the gram-positive bacteria are also closely related and are most likely susceptible to the same type of drug treatment. On the other hand, it's possible that species 1, which is gram-negative, and species 2, which is gram-positive, are more closely related to each other than either are to species 3 or 4. In this case, it's probably not reasonable to assume that a single gram-positive drug treatment would be effective, or that a single gram-negative drug treatment would be effective. And I'm going to leave you with a question to think about. Why are the steps beyond the addition of crystal violet necessary to distinguish between gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria?